Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to be talking about discrimination on the show today. Discrimination is a very volatile topic. It can harness a lot of emotions in people when you're talking about it, especially when you're coming at it from a libertarian perspective. Libertarians believe in free association, and we believe in freedom, freedom of choice, freedom of will, and freedom to decide who you want to interact with and who you do not want to interact with. And if we think about it, we discriminate a lot in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, when you go out to a restaurant, you are discriminating against all the other restaurants that you could have possibly gone to. So maybe you think that a restaurant is more cleanly than another one, or you like the food better, or you like the wait staff better, or for a myriad other reasons, you chose that particular restaurant as opposed to any of the other restaurants that you could have chosen. Uh, in the same way, when we choose a partner or a dating uh, person in our lives, we are choosing based on a number of factors, and we are disassociating ourselves from other people who we could have chosen to have that relationship with. So when choosing a partner, you know, you might look at different traits that that person has to offer to you. Um, maybe you're looking for intelligence or compassion or generosity or uh, compatibility with you and your um, shared interests that you would have with that person. Maybe you're looking for someone who's financially responsible, who can hold a job and can make sure that they can bring resources home to the family. Uh, you might be looking for somebody who has a particular family um, organization style that you like. Uh, there's a myriad ways that we look at people and we discriminate based on our tastes and our preferences, based on who we want to interact with. You can see this in your friendships. We don't choose everybody for our friends. We choose people who we like and who we want to interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And yes, we are discriminating against people who we do not want to be friends with. And so libertarians look at this and we say, well, economically, we don't see any real difference between choosing people as a friendship and choosing people to interact with on a business sense. For example, as a uh, software developer, I choose my clients based on whether I like how their interactions with me go. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who want to have web software built for them who are going to demand you know, every single feature, who are not really going to pay for the amount of time that I spend on the project, who are going to you know, require me to go and make all this change you know, halfway through the project. We call it uh, creep, uh, scope creep where the project's scope kind of changes halfway through the project. I don't want to deal with those kind of clients. And so I discriminate against people who I find are going to, you know, endeavor in those kind of behaviors that are going to make it much harder for me and also not be worth my time in terms of the amount of money that I'm being paid for my project. And so this kind of discrimination pops up in a lot of different areas of our lives. But in certain ways, some people seem to draw the line. Uh, you can judge based on intelligence, based on uh, how warm people are when they interact with you, but you can't judge based on uh, race or height or uh, other things that people judge people on. And libertarians, while we may not like that people judge people based on skin or gender or height or any of these kind of more arbitrary or more uh, not really changeable traits that people have, we may not like that, but we accept that people are going to make decisions that we may or may not like, and that's part of freedom. And so the reason that I'm bringing this up today is that recently there's been a lot of news about people who are getting married and who are going to the flower people or to the cake people or to the people who are putting on the wedding, uh, a chapel or a church maybe, and they're being denied based on their uh, gender or based on their marital relations. And this is specifically more for homosexuals who are trying to get married under the new laws that are great that we should be passing, who are allowing people of different genders, of different uh, areas of life to get married, and that's all a wonderful thing. However, they are using the state to force people to render services to them. So there's been examples of uh, people who have been getting married who go to the cake registry place and the cake 
uh, bakery refuses to create a cake for them. And so they go to the state and they say, this person refused to give me services on account of discrimination. Uh, we are a homosexual couple and we would like to get this person to bake us a cake. And they said, because we are homosexual, they will not bake us a cake. And so the government comes in and tries to write this social justice and everybody calls discrimination against the person who is baking the cake. And so they come in with courts and laws and tries to force the person to render the cake to the people who are getting married. But to libertarians, we just say that this is free association. Again, we might not like the choices that people make, but it's very important that people are allowed to make the choices that they want to make. Because again, once we get into discrimination, we're talking about people's choices. And by limiting people's choices, you know, based on whatever criteria they are making those choices on is a slippery slope towards totalitarianism and towards the law being used to force people to bend to people who think they know better's will. And so I want to read an article a little bit uh, expanding on this particular point, uh, talking about an experience that he had with a landlord who would not rent to him because he was a particular race or gender. And this article is by um, Sandy Aikida, and it's called Trading with the Other. Can Mutual Benefit Overcome Racism? Just after my wife and I got married, a real estate agent showed us an apartment owned by a woman of a certain age. We loved it. We had been apartment hunting all over the city and were relieved to finally find a place that had everything we wanted at a reasonable rent. Imagine our shock when the agent told us the woman didn't want to rent to us because of our race. All three of us were upset and disappointed, but rather than raise a big fuss, my wife and I decided to look elsewhere. Some weeks later, after we still hadn't found anything we liked, the agent called us and told us that the landlady had changed her mind and that she would rent the unit to us after all. My wife and I thought long and hard about whether to take it. Did we really want to rent from someone like that? In the end, we did because we were so tired of looking. We all managed to get along. In fact, by the time we bought a place of our own and moved out of that apartment four years later, we were on very friendly terms with her and had been invited into her home more than once for cookies, tea, and conversation. There are important lessons in this story. First, beyond the basic lesson that a free exchange will take place only if both parties expect a benefit, there is the lesson that trade can bring people together whose differences might otherwise keep them apart. Profit-seeking gives us an incentive to overcome the worst of our prejudices. We can learn that the stranger with whom we trade shares with us a set of basic values, such as honesty and fair dealing. Fear and misunderstanding hinder trade, but trade can minimize fear and misunderstanding. Our story illustrates a second lesson. If you want to indulge in racial discrimination in a free market, you'll have to pay for it, literally. The same goes for discrimination based on gender, sexual orientation, religion, and so on. I can't say for certain that our landlord's inability to rent the apartment to anyone else after she turned us down was the only factor. I suspect the real estate agent probably pestered her about it, too. But I'm pretty sure it was a big factor. The cost of her discriminating against us was the rent that she didn't get. Some people might be willing to pay for discriminating, but other things equal, probably fewer than if discrimination were costless. What if there had been a long line of people waiting to rent her apartment, if there had been more people willing and able to pay than there were apartments to rent, such as a shortage? Such, such shortages occur under rent control when the legal maximum rent is set below the market rent. In that case, not only does the monetary cost of discrimination fall to zero, because rejecting us would simply mean renting to someone else more eager to pay the below market rent, but landlords can simply pick and choose who the lucky ones might be based on merely their own personal preferences. Under rent control, there is no need to overcome significant prejudices. Social psychologists have confirmed that we all have a strong bias towards homophily or associating with people who are very much like us. Race is a strong factor here. 
profit-seeking in markets can offset that tendency, but by the same token, in the absence of freely adjusting prices to ration scarce resources, our biases are less constrained. While price ceilings on housing have a host of negative consequences, unleashing our prejudices is one of the uglier ones, and few realize it. A price ceiling, a maximum legal price, is one form of price control. Another is a price floor, such as a legal minimum wage, and it has the same negative consequence. Many left progressives support minimum wage laws because they want to help the poor and certain minority groups. Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York, for example, recently came out strongly in favor of a lo large raise in the local minimum wage. Employers can adjust to higher mandatory wages by cutting back on work hours or on worker benefits, such as flexible schedules, food discounts, and the like. But one bad consequence that gets less attention, even from people who oppose raising legal minimum wages, is how minimum wage laws enable discrimination of various kinds, including racial and ethnic discrimination, which modern progressives claim to abhor. Similar to a free housing market in a free job market, if you discriminate against someone for any reason who is capable of doing a good job for you, you'll pay the price of losing that person's competence and choosing someone less competent. If you don't hire the most qualified applicant because, say, she's a woman, then the price you pay is higher, the better the job she could have done than the less qualified man you hired instead. It's the same with discriminating on the basis of race. Again, if there was a large pool of unemployed people with different skill levels from which to choose, indulging in discrimination would be less costly. That's precisely what tends to happen when government sets the legal minimum above the market wage rate. A chronic surplus of labor called unemployment ensues. Modern progressives claim to support minimum wage laws as well as rent controls to help the least well-off in society who are disproportionately African-American or Hispanic. But the effect of minimum wage laws is to make it easier for employers to indulge in racial discrimination, again, because it costs less to do so. And when the minimum wage is raised, employers have an incentive to hire only people with better job skills who will be worth the higher wage, leaving unemployed or underemployed those whose skills would be best developed on the job. Many of the latter are young and from the ma racial minority groups modern progressives would most like to help. The unintended consequence of this regulation is typically more government intervention. That is, in today's ideological milieu, the political response to the housing shortages and discrimination that result from government intervention is to call for more intervention, well-meaning but more cumbersome regulations, costly subsidies, and high taxes that attempt to address the artificial shortage of opportunities in housing and employment for targeted minorities. The solution begins with identifying what's wrong and addressing the problem with good ideas, sound thinking, and rational action. An effective cure for the destructive ignorance my wife and I encountered is to preserve the freedom to associate or not with people of our choosing as long as we aren't shielded from the consequences of those choices by misguided public policy. That article was by Sandy Akita, and it was called Trading with the Other, can mutual benefit overcome racism? And it was posted on the Foundation for Economic Education, FEE.org. So let's take what we learned in that article and kind of apply it to our original example of the bakery that was unwilling to render their services to a particular couple getting married. So this couple was of the same gender and they wanted the bakery to build them a cake for their wedding and the bakery refused. Now, it could be that the couple decided not to go and look around in the market to try and find a competitor who was willing to give them a cake. They just went right to the government and said, government, you know, these guys are bad. They won't give us a cake. And uh, that's a possibility. However, it could also be that government laws have limited the amount of bakeries in that area such that there were no competitors to try and 
get a cake uh, to purchase for their wedding. So government laws on food, government laws on zoning and uh, setting up businesses, all the taxes that are required to start a new business might have hindered a potential bakery from coming up who catered maybe solely to people who want to get married in this particular way. And so maybe government has enabled this kind of discrimination to occur, and then people run to the government to try and fix it through, again, more intervention. When freedom, in the first case of letting the market work, where businesses just pop up and serve people's interests, uh, could have been the solution where no force, no government laws, no courts could, uh, needed to be used to actually solve this problem. And so we can really see here that Ludwig von Mises' insight about intervention and how the original government intervention leads to further and further interventions to correct the problems caused by the earlier intervention. Uh, We see this really coming to light where businesses use regulations to uh, monopolize and cartelize the market where they are the sole providers of services of a particular good. And then people say, oh, that's not fair. Their prices are too high. Their quality is garbage, you know, and, and people get all very upset about that to, you know, understandably so. But it was the original intervention by government that allowed that business to get out of control and to have a monopoly on the market. It's the laws that are put in place in the first place that we need to correct if we want the market to be flowing and free and able to provide a myriad different services without a monopoly, without cartelizing the market. So the uh, last article I would like to read to you is uh, posted on the Mises Institute, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G, and it's uh, talking about the gender pay gap. And uh, the article is by Andrew Sirios, and it's called What's Behind the Gender Wage Gap? Some myths die hard. The myth of the gender wage gap is one that's had particularly long legs. Right after winning an Academy Award, Patricia Arquette proclaimed that, quote, it's our time to have wage equality once and for all and equal rights for women in the United States of America to thunderous applause. In her Eleven Commandments of Progressivism, Elizabeth Warren so is so beside herself, she writes, quote, I can't believe I have to say this in 2014. We believe in equal pay for equal work. President Obama established an equal pay task force, and one of his first acts was to pass the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. It's all but taken for granted. Women make 77 cents on the dollar compared to what a man makes for the same work. I've been taught this since grade school. Indeed, it would seem to be that the only people who disagree with this are actual economists who study the issue. As many have noted, a question quickly comes up when discussing wage discrepancies between two groups. If employers care so much about money, which progressives seem to be convinced of, why would they ever hire a man when they can hire a woman to do the same thing for three quarters the cost? Jobs are not homogeneous. But a second problem comes up after just briefly scratching the data. Why isn't this wage gap even remotely close to being consistent across industries? It's not just models who make 10 times as much as their male colleagues, but also a variety, albeit minority, of different fields. Forbes recently ran an article based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics titled 15 Jobs Where Women Earn More Than Men. These jobs include bakers, 104%, teachers' assistants, 105%, nutritionists, 101%, and occupational therapists, 102%. Do those hiring bakers just happen to be some of the few people in this country who aren't sexist? What about location? The Huffington Post ran a similar article based on census data titled, The 11 Cities Where Women Out-Earn Men by the Biggest Margin. They include Atlanta, 121%, New York, 117%, and San Diego, 115%. And as Warren Farrell notes, the 2003 Census Bureau Current Population Survey showed that when women and men work less than 40 hours a week, the women earn more than the men, 134% for between 25 to 34 hours, and 107% for between 35 and 39 hours. 
Add to this another interesting fact, a study by the American Association of University Women, a group that strongly believes in the wage gap, found that, quote, Overall, the regression analysis of earnings one year after graduation suggests that a 5% pay gap between women and men remains after accounting for all variables known to affect earnings. Leaving aside the fact that regression analyses cannot be taken as gospel, there's simply no way to control for every variable. Even so, 5% is a lot less than the supposed 23% wage gap. Why would employers discriminate more as women got older? So the wage gap is not only inconsistent with employers' best interests, it's also inconsistent across industries, locations, hours worked, and ages. Yes, this doesn't sound suspicious at all. As I've discussed before, differences do not automatically equal discrimination. After all, Asian Americans are paid more than whites, and Japanese Americans are paid more than Korean Americans. For crying out loud, lesbian women make more than straight women. One must dig a little bit deeper before settling on discrimination as the end-all explanation. Men and women often have different career goals. Once you dig a little deeper, it becomes abundantly clear that men and women do not treat work or life in the same way. By either culture, biology, or a mix of the two, men place a higher value on income. For example, a survey of men's and women's reasons for obtaining an MBA found out, quote, men acquiring an MBA aspire to become president or CEO of both public or private companies. Women MBAs, however, ranked management consulting, executive level vice president positions, and nonprofit executive management high among their career goals. Men expect to hold the top leadership possessions, and for women, it is still the exception. This would explain why men are more likely to seek after dangerous jobs with hazard pay. Thus, men make up 93% of workplace fatalities. Professor James Bennett found 20 differences between what men and women do in the workplace that influence income that aren't found in the raw numbers, which is all the 77 cents on the dollar takes into account. These reasons include men go into technology and hard sciences more than women. Men tend to take more stressful jobs that are not 9 to 5. Men are more likely to work longer hours, and the pay gap widens for every hour past 40 hours per week. Women are more likely to have gaps in their careers, primarily because of child rearing and child care. Less experience means lower pay. The reason women are more likely to have a gap in their career is what economist Walter Block coined as marriage asymmetry hypothesis in a study criticizing the wage gap back in 1981. Namely, when a man and woman get married, what typically happens is that the man will take on the lion's share of making money and the woman will take on the lion's share of raising the children, a fact that has been demonstrated time and time again. Whether this is right or wrong is irrelevant to the discussion at hand. The only thing that matters here is if the wage gap is due to discrimination. And the major differences between men and women in workplace behavior, primarily as a result of marriage, cast a lot of doubt on the discrimination hypothesis. As De Denise Verable points out in her analysis of the wage gap, quote, in general, married women per would prefer part-time work at a rate of 5 to 1 over married men. This is probably why part-time women earn more than part-time men. Furthermore, women over 25 years of age have held their current job for an average of 4.4 years versus 5 years for men, and pay raises come with seniority. In addition, expectations and future plans play a big role in these decisions. As economist Thomas, Thomas Sowell observes, quote, women tend not to go into occupations in which there's a very high rate of obsolescence. If you're a computer engineer and you take five years to have a child and raise him until the age you can put him in daycare, well, my gosh, the world has changed. You'd have to start way, way back. On the other hand, if you become a librarian, a teacher, or other occupations like that, you can take your five years off and then come pretty much back to where you left off. Computer engineers generally make more than librarians. Never married women make more than men. 
Indeed, when comparing never married women with never married men, the wage gap doesn't just disappear, it flips. As far back as 1971, never married women in their 30s have earned slightly more than similar men. In 1982, never married women on the whole earned 91% of what men do. Today, among men and women living from the age 21 to 35, there is no wage gap. And among unmarried college-educated men and women between 40 and 64, men earn an average of $40,000 a year and women earn an average of $47,000 a year. And when all of this is taken into account, the wage gap all but disappears, as many studies have found. A study by the CONSAD Research Corp. for the U.S. Department of Labor found that once they controlled for the variables, there was an, an adjusted gender wage gap that is between 4.8 and 7.1 percent. A study by June and Dave O'Neill for the National Bureau of Economic Research found that, quote, the gender gap largely stems from choices made by women and men concerning the amount of time and energy devoted to a career. Warren Farrell conducted a thorough study reported in his book Why Men Earn More and found no evidence of a wage gap. A 1983 study by Walter E. Williams and the aforementioned 1981 study by Walter Block discredit the idea that the wage gap is caused by discrimination. Kerry Lucas notes that in a 2010 study of single, childless urban workers between the ages of 22 and 30, the research firm Research Advisors found that women earned an average of 8% more than their male counterparts. Even PolitiFact rated the, the claim that women are paid 77 cents on the dollar for doing the same work as men as mostly false. It's certainly possible that the small remaining gap in the CONSAT report is because of discrimination, although it's just as likely to be other variables that weren't accounted for since no study can have perfect controls. For example, how does one control for motivation and personal work-slash-life goals? Regardless, most of the gap has to do with choices. There's nothing wrong with women's choices. Indeed, there may be something wrong with men's, as seeking a work-life balance is probably a wiser decision. Still, it is these decisions that are the primary reason for the wage gap, not discrimination. This stubborn fact might explain why, despite all of their protests, the White House paid women only 88 cents on the dollar, compared to men, and even Hillary Clinton herself only paid women on her staff 72 cents compared to men. Reality just doesn't seem to care much about rhetoric. That article was by Andy... Uh, Sirius, and it was posted on Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org. It's called What's Behind the Gender Wage Gap. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Austrian Circle. We talked about discrimination on the show today and how the market actively reduces discrimination by allowing people to buy and sell freely in a competitive market where any business can pop up and start providing services to any consumer, and how the government increases the amount of discrimination in society because it reduces those uh, competitive factors that allow new businesses to jump into the market and start providing uh, alternative products to the current competitors. And also how things like the minimum wage law uh, increase the discrimination because employers have an entire pool of people who are really trying to get a job and are desperate to get that job. And so the employer, because he has you know hundreds of people he can choose from, can choose to use his personal preferences to hire who he wants to hire. Uh, we also talked about the wage gap and how when looking at the numbers, we find that it's uh, mostly overblown and mostly a myth. So I hope that you enjoyed this show. Uh, I hope that you'll tune in next week for another episode. I'm your host, Racker. Have a great week. Take care.